Aloha. I'm Desmin Hakias with Healing with Aloha, where we bring hope and healing uh, with Aloha. Um, I'm Desmin Hakias. I'm the host. And this is my friend, Ikea Norris. I'm fortunate to have met her back in 2017 when you were still in Pittsburgh, correct? And now she's in North Carolina. Um, so she's multi-passionate. Um, we're both moms. Um, we're single moms. She's She's about to get married soon. And so without further ado, I'm going to have her share um, what she does because she's a very multi-passionate woman and I'm inspired by her example. Oh, well, thank you so much. Um, so yeah, I am definitely multi-passionate. There's so <laughs> many things that I love to do and that I aspire to do. Um, but for over the last 12 to 13 years, I have specifically been an educator. Um, also, I am recently a NAMI Family Support Group Facilitator. Um, NAMI is the National Alliance on Mental Illness. I'm also a writer. So I write everything from poetry to music to books, which I am planning on publishing this year. And I'm also the founder of Parenting with Power Online Support Community. Um, and then I'm a mother of a soon-to-be 14-year-old <laughs> boy. So. <laughs> that's awesome um so i wanted you to share uh, what what inspired you because i know you do like a lot of things um but let's rewind a little bit okay um can you share with everybody um how old are you when you had your son and what did you learn because he's about to turn 14 and now you can reflect back on your life as a mom um, and as a woman, um, how old are you when you became a parent? So I was the tender age of 16 when I birthed my son 14 years ago. So I am currently 30 years old. Um, oh my gosh, there's so many lessons that I have learned along the way. Um, but one I think that is the greatest is to value myself. Um, because ultimately I realized that I set the bar for him. Um, yeah. You know, being that I had been a single parent, he had one parent to look to, and that was me. Um, and so absolutely, there were things that, because I was young and immature, there was a lot of things, unfortunately, that I can say that I did expose him to um, that was negative. Yeah. That if I could go back, I would definitely change those things. But like I said, looking back now, I realized that, you know, I have to set the bar of how to value yourself. And so I've definitely learned to value myself um, in the way that I carry myself, the things that I do and the things that I don't do. Um, and I also want to note that it's not just about what you do um, in front of them, because I, I've had some uh, interactions with people where they're one way in front of their kids, but then behind closed doors, you know, they're another way. And I'm like, I want to demonstrate to him and be a model of being honest and being yeah. real. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, if I was this polished up mother in front of him, but behind the behind closed doors, I'm out here, you know, in the streets doing craziness, that's going to end up showing up somewhere. Eventually, yes. Yeah. So it's like, that's one thing that I've learned to really just, you know, like I said, um, to value myself and to be that model and example to him. So do you think that might have like, helped you to do what you're doing now because you just became a founder of parenting parenting with power yes absolutely i mean that definitely that passion for parenting with power came from my personal experiences because like i said i know that i need it and i i did have the opportunity to meet some phenomenal um parents along my journey my journey but um one thing that i really aspire is to just be that support and let other parents know that it's okay to be you. It's okay to be flawed. It's okay to make mistakes. You right. know I, mean? I just wanted a, a, a community and wanted to create a community or a platform where parents can see that, you know, like, this is real parenting. This is, you know, it's not perfect. You know what I mean? So I had started sharing on the blog. I started sharing um, on, like, Instagram and social media on Facebook just my personal experiences. And that's how Parenting with Power really began. Cause I was like, I'm just tired of all this fake stuff. You know, I used to watch like reality TV and I'm like, 
no, like this is fake. Like, I just want to see some real lives. You know what I mean? So I decided to start sharing my personal experiences. And it not only, um, I don't think that it not only helped other people, but it helped me as well to really begin to unpack all of that trauma and all of the guilt and all the shame and stuff. Once I got that stuff out there, it was like, okay, it's out. You know, now move right. on, move on. A lot of um, vulnerability and transparency. Like, I'm not trying to front that I'm this exactly. perfect parent because nobody's perfect. Nobody. Exactly. And I will be honest because I lived that for a little while. I did. Um, because that I had some guilt and I had some shame about a lot of the things that I did when I was younger um, that, that were shameful. Um, I walked and I walked around with that guilt and that shame. And so then it got to where I would, when I was in college and a little bit after college, um, I did try to, you know, present myself as this perfect, um, you know, person because I was trying to hide the guilt and the shame that I, that I faced at home when I was crying on my pillow, when I was, you know, looking at myself in the mirror, like not loving me because of the things that I did. Um, and so, like I said, once I began to, I said, you know, I'm just tired. I got to the point where I was like, I'm tired of carrying this stuff around. Like, I'm tired. I want to be free from this stuff. I want to be able to embrace myself. Um, and so I just decided to just take that leap of faith and just throw my business out there on the internet. <laughs> and, you know, like I said, ultimately, as I began to do it more, I became more confident. And, you know, um, I just began to realize, like, you're not the only one. Yeah. You're not the only person that has made mistakes as a woman, as a parent, you know? And then I started to also read different like parenting books. And again, that allowed me to see like, okay, I'm not the only person who thought that about my child or about myself or about yes. my child's father or whatever. And it just became very empowering. And that, that just, you know, led me to begin to try to empower other people. So No, and I think it's important because, I mean, I know there's books, right? But we learn a lot from the people who raised us. Mm -hmm. And so depending on how they taught us, whether they intended to or not, it, it teaches us how to be as parents. And we can realize and learn if we step back that, okay, the style of teaching from my parent is not going to work with this child. You know, maybe it worked in for them, right. but I don't think I liked it. <laughs> like, I didn't like the way I was talked to. I didn't like what I was treated. Um, I'm not going to enforce the same rules, the same mm -hmm. expectations, the same. Um, and so I think it's, it's important for, for you. What you're doing is you're empowering parents to step back in and really look at what they're doing and ask themselves why and then modify accordingly because mm -hmm. each child is different you, and absolutely. stuff like that absolutely so it's good that um you you're doing it because you're you're letting people know like just break down the walls and just yeah. let it out like there's exactly. nothing to prove and if you if you have to go an extra mile to prove you're a good person and you're a good parent then the people you're talking to are engaging with that's not your friends I'm sorry. I don't care if it's family or friends. Like if they cannot love and accept you at your worst, then who are they to be at your best? I agree. I agree. <laughs> um, you were sharing with me earlier about what you learned growing up um, with mental illness and why, because of your, your growing up uh, being around people you love with mental illnesses that prompted you to go into the fields as an educator and then even with like you just getting certified um can you share a little bit about what um occurred in your family that allowed you to have compassion and empathy towards other people um dealing with mental illnesses yeah absolutely so i grew up in a single parent home with my mother um and so i can remember you know in my younger years like maybe like elementary um I can remember my mother having a lot of people around us, um, you know, whether it was cousins, friends. And so we were kind of like that house that, you know, everybody kind of gathered. Um, and so I can remember like the good times of when we were social and we had a lot of people over and we would go out to the amusement parks in the summer and, 
you know, my mother was very active. Um, you know, we'd go shopping to the parks, all kind of things. Um, and then when I was in the fifth grade is when there was a total shift. And um, I didn't know at the time, but now that I'm older and I look back, I, now I understand what happened. Um, I mm -hmm. remember when I was in the living room, I was sitting on the couch. I can still see it like a picture, like I'm watching a movie. And I remember um, my mother being carried down the steps on a stretcher um, and out the door. And then um, I remember going over to my aunt's house, who my aunt actually lived next door. So we were neighbors to her older sister. And I was with my aunt for a little bit. And um, I remember them just telling me that my mom was at the hospital. Um, I think I remember talking to her on the phone. Mm -hmm. And then that is all that I recall as far as that. I don't know how long she was in the hospital, um, but I do remember that event happening. And what I learned later as an adult is that she attempted suicide. Wow. Um, and so when she had came back home, um, she was a totally different person. It was almost like she was a zombie. Um, she didn't have that um, life, like that personality that she had before. Um, and so then I just remember times after that, honestly, um, between like fifth grade and middle school, I was very active in school. So like I played volleyball, I was on the um, drill team. Um, I was in a group called Best Friends. Um, it was for a, a girls group, mentoring group. Um, I was in beta club and I was just very active in school. So I can see how in those years, I didn't remember much about what was going on at home because I was pretty much always on the go. <laughs> yeah, but it was all positive. It, it looked like you threw yourself into positive activities. Yeah, and I think that probably the adults at that time probably were guiding me in that way because they knew the situation. Mm -hmm. um, so I just remember ve being very active as well as in the community. I had like, we lived in a neighborhood where my grandmother was like three doors down. My aunt was our next door neighbor. I had another aunt who lived like right across the street. Wow, and that's close. All <laughs> in the community. So it was like my family, we almost all live in like the same community. And so a lot of times I would be outdoors all day long. I would be playing. So it really wasn't, it didn't really uh, affect me during that time because like I said, I was involved in other activities and I had a lot of family support. Now, when I got to high school, um, it was a little bit different because I wasn't as active. And I think at that time, just going through that weird transition of adolescence, um, I just was trying to still figure myself out. And so I wasn't really involved in anything. But unfortunately, what did happen was I started to get negatively involved um, in things outside of the house in the community because at that time, like I said, my mother was still dealing with her depression, anxiety, and all that kind of stuff. And she would sleep, I mean, like, she would sleep most of the day away. Wow. So, I mean, I can remember, if I came home after school, my mother would sleep. Um, I would leave, go outside, come back home, you know, maybe nine o'clock in the evening, she sleep. So, like, she was sleeping the days away. So I didn't really have that parental guidance at home, mm -hmm. um, literally. So, you know, I then would turn to my peers, you know? And so that's unfortunately what, guidance, had, yeah. what had occurred with me. But like I said, and that was just the norm. And it, it just became the norm of knowing that, okay, mom is going to be asleep all day. So you fend for yourself. Um, and so, you know, that's just the way that life kind of was. My mother also had stopped working. So she was out of work for uh, the time of, of her attempt for 14 years. Wow. And that, that's how severe her depression was. And it really, it really just stopped her in her tracks as far as her life was concerned. So I had to just, you know, cope in whatever ways that, that, that I knew, because I really didn't have anybody who was giving me any coping tools. There was nobody that was having a conversation with me about, this is what your mother's experiencing. and this is why she's doing this. You know, there were also times as well as, um, now when she was awake, um, then, because I started to get in trouble in school, and so then a lot of the interactions that we would have was, it was anger, because why are you cutting up in school, and why are you getting in trouble? So it's like our interactions started to be negative, because, well, when I am home, and if, you know, I need something or anything, you're sleeping, but then 
the only communication that we're having is when you're addressing my behavior in school. Right. But no time like bad. Yeah. Yeah, but there's no time being spent to, you know, just have a mother daughter relationship. So that was a very um, traumatic experience to have as a young girl. Um, and like I said, which ended up resulting was I was really into a lot of negative things in the community. I was smoking marijuana. I was going out to the clubs. I was hanging out in the streets in horrible places. I mean, like literally horrible places. Like I was telling you earlier, I've been in places where people were shooting um, wow. just negative situations. And that's how ultimately I did um, become acquainted with my son's father and was a teenage parent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah it must have been um I, you know when you go through like you're just going right mm -hmm. but when you look back do you feel like there's a lot of sadness that you, you know what so there are times that I, I have looked back on my life and I felt a lot of just like regret um and specifically I'll be honest I had a lot of regret as far as the person that I had a child with. I really did. Um, because th that was not, he was not a person, he did not value me, he did not respect me. Um, in fact, he was very disrespectful, he was also abusive. Um, and so for a long time, I would say probably for like nine or 10 years of my son's life, I regretted that, I really did. And that was, that was the most heaviest burden for me to walk around with. It really was. But I never, I always say, I never regretted my child because he was honestly the best thing that happened to me. Yeah. I honestly think that I don't know if I would be alive. I don't know if I would be free if my son did not come in my life at that time. Because like I said, I was in the streets. <laughs> okay, right. I was into some negative things. And it, I could have easily been shot dead I could have easily got myself into some trouble where it was you know legal stuff where I could have been sent to jail or whatever um so I know my son was he was God's grace for me to turn my life Your focus to, yeah um and to have that focus and that motivation and everything but I can honestly say that I live with that regret as far as the person who was the dad the, the, the second parent did you feel um, like angry? Cause I, I know like you regretted, like it, did it come from a heart of anger? Cause you never wanted that for your child to not have both parents loving them and being there to guide them. Is that what was the underlying regret? I think it was a lot of shame because number one, I, here I was a single parent. First of all, before a single parent, here I was a teen parent. <laughs> And there was a lot of shame that came with that because um, like at the time we were going to a church and there was a lot of remarks and comments made Respect. concerning me being pregnant at 15 years old. Um, even when I was in school, I would get looked at a certain way. I felt very alienated as the girl who's pregnant <laughs> in 10th grade. Um, so it was a lot of shame that came with the fact of me being pregnant. And then also on top of that, it was a lot of shame again for the person because I knew that, you know, what he was into, his lifestyle. I mean, he did he had a bad reputation. Like he right. was he wasn't a parent a parent like he was not someone you'd want. Not at all. Not at all. So there was a lot of shame as far as that. And like you said, on top of now my son has to grow up with that same pain that I did because my father was not present in my life. Hmm. So there was layers to that <laughs> regret and that shame and that guilt and that anger, you know? And there was also, I'm gonna even go further to another layer of that anger was the fact that I used to feel like if my dad was here, he would have protected me from all of this. And he right. right. So then you felt like even more, yeah, alone. I had so much that I, I had so much that I was walking around with layers and layers of pain and regret and shame and guilt and hurt and anger and you name it, bitterness all wrapped up in one. <laughs> right. 
and and that's and that's gotta be hard you know what i mean like i know you're an adult now but when you look back a lot of people carry that pain today and i think you're really instrumental in helping people to understand that it it it's it's normal and it's okay to understand that it hurts Mm -hmm. and to acknowledge that hurt and allow people who are safe, whether it's family, friends, a professional, to allow them in because the shame keeps people far from you. Mm -hmm. But when you realize you're not alone Mm -hmm. and you allow people in to help you, the pressure, the intensity, it, it lightens the load in your heart, in your mind, emotionally, mentally, physically, because if not, you're just going to keep repeating this vicious cycle. You know what I mean? The family secrets, just mm-hmm. the shame and whatnot. It's all generational. Yeah. But if you can just let, let put that aside and just say, okay, I surrender. I'm going to get the help I need. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and that's where I had actually got. And it's like, when I look back on my journey, I see how I have really been blessed with the people that I have encountered because it's like I, I can see every uh, milestone of my life that there was somebody there who just picked me up and helped me to continue on and so actually when I was I think I was really at wit's end I was 19 years old um and like you said I had been walking around with all of that for these years because mind you I, I got pregnant at 15 had my son at 16. So from 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 years old, I'm walking around with this load. And I mean, it is just getting heavier and heavier. And I finally got to the point when I was 19 where I said, I'm tired of carrying this. I don't want this anymore. Like something has got to give. And I had actually ran into um, a young lady that I went to high school with, and she had told me about Young Lives. Young Lives is a teen mom mentoring program. Nice. And I mean, it was like exactly what I needed at that time. Because also, I was in college. This is my first year in college. And like I said, just like when I was in high school, even in college, I stood out like a sore thumb amongst my peers because they didn't have children. By the yeah. time I was in college, I had a kid who was in school already. My son was in kindergarten, you know? So here I am. I could relate more to the, the working adults who were taking college classes than my actual peers. Yeah. Um, and so it's like, I just, again, I started to just feel that shame and thing. A lot of times I can remember being ashamed to even let people know that I had a son. Like a lot of times I wouldn't even talk about it. I tried to pretend like I was the normal college student on campus yeah. and I was not. Um, and so anyway, when I had gotten to Young Lives, which was a program full of other teen moms who could relate to me, it was just so liberating to yeah. be around other people. It's like, you get it, you know, because <laughs> around me gets me right now not at church not at school not at home like I have nobody who gets me um and so that was definitely like a saving grace and that's where I had met my mentor Miss Joy she is just phenomenal I mean she's taught me just so much about womanhood about motherhood just about life in general and to this day we still keep in contact but that's just you know one of those um, programs where I was able to to talk about a lot of stuff that, like I said, I was walking around carrying a lot of stuff that nobody knew about me. Nobody yeah, knew being yeah. abused. Nobody knew the things that I was experiencing. Nobody knew the thoughts that I was having concerning myself. You know, but mm-hmm. I was able to share that stuff. You know, there and so again, that's that's another reason that I started Parenting with Power because it's like I want other people to know that it is okay to know that you're not alone and to have that support. And then also, like I had shared earlier when I had stated, nobody was teaching me how to cope. Nobody right. was teaching me how to cope with, first of all, life in general. Nobody was having conversations with me about, you know, the changes that come with puberty and, you know, adolescence. Like I didn't have those conversations from nobody. Wow. You know? And 
Nobody was teaching me how to cope with living with a, a loved one that's suffering with mental illness. You know, and so that's one of the things that I do with Parents with Power. I provide a lot of educational resources and things that specifically focus on mental health so that people know, you know, more about it and that there's awareness and that people also provide resources so that people know how to cope as a parent and if you have a child with mental uh, illness as well. So that's awesome because you're coming like from a perspective, not just book knowledge, but I lived through it. Lived experience. <laughs> yeah. Cause I, I respect anyone who, who's in, in the field of healing and, you know, educating and whatnot. However, when someone actually have lived through something and come out of it, that gives me hope. Yes. And I think that's what we need. We need to have hope that I'm not alone. Mm-hmm. And that someone has gone through it right. years later and here they are sharing their story and they're not shame. They don't feel the shame mm-hmm. because no a lot of the things you shared, a lot of people felt shame. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Um, uh, like the reason why I do um, healing with the Aloha podcast is because, you know, when they do studies like sociology, psychology, and they always do statistics. Right. And, and like, I grew up with someone in my family who was an alcoholic and who struggled with addictions and whatnot. And so they always say, oh, well, if, if you grew up in this environment, then this is going to happen and whatnot. And so, you know, I, I grew up being exposed to a lot of trauma. And, and then um, I ended up having a sister die. Um, because she was in a, a vehicle accident and she died like literally like right after the accident and so I just felt like a statistic you know like okay statistics show this and that and I didn't really want to talk about it so the shock and the denial the anger was there for years years uh, you're looking at like eight years and then when I finally came out of it uh I my 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 grandmother died. I got divorced, became a single parent. Right after I got divorced, my dad died. He was in an accident and then he died unexpectedly. My grandfather died the year after from cancer. And wow. then last year, my, my last grandparent, who I consider one of my best friends, she died. And so I had to finally look back, like you did reflect and realize I had to help someone. And so the podcast was to help someone who's grieving because the journey through grief beginning with my sister 2001 was so hard. Mm-hmm. And so I, I didn't, it's not like something you casually talk about, Oh, by the way, you know, my oh. sister died in a vehicle accident or whatever. And then, and then to go be, before that and share your personal life of trauma and, you know, like it, it's hard, but when you can get past that fear of people judging you, it's powerful. And, so being able to use the podcast to, to help other people grieving or people who've lived through difficult life situations and, and understanding mental health is powerful. Like we were talking about earlier, that when you say the word mental health, a lot of times there's shame mm-hmm. and then people don't understand it, but yet are they trying to understand it? Like education on mental health has, has been there for years but do you want to try to understand it or are you just going to judge it? Yeah. You know, and I think that's why it's powerful that you, you did start with your, cause it, the, um, the parenting um, with power, it's, it's more multidimensional. It's not mm-hmm. just this one layer, right? Right. Exactly. And I was intentional about that because, you know, like I said, I initially started with it, just me and me sharing my parental experiences But then also because I work in education and I primarily work with youth, I also wanted to make sure that I was reaching the youth as well. And, you know, and a lot of times you hear people talking about be who you needed to, you needed to be when you were younger. And so I think back on that little girl who needed some support, who needed some resources, you know, so I'm really approaching both the parent and the child. Um, at the same time. So. And you know, and I know, kids are going to tell you something they won't tell their parents. Yeah, yeah. And the parents could be saying the right message 
and the kids won't listen to the parent, but they'll listen to you. <laughs> I work with you for like 10 years and the parent, I, I actually sit down and ask them, oh, what did your mom tell you? Da, da, da. And then I talk to the parents and I'm like, wait, but the parent is right. But it's just, they don't like the messenger. <laughs> right. Exactly. You know, which is understandable because it's like, when you look at, um, you know, what happens to a child as they're in, you know, pre-adolescence, going through puberty, like, once you begin to know more, that's why I just love education. I believe knowledge is so powerful because the more that you know, the better you can do. So the more that you begin to understand, okay, what's really going on with my child? You know, look at what's going on with my child developmentally, you know, observe them, have those conversations. Then you can begin to understand their thinking and, and their behavior, and then you can address it. But if you're just coming and thinking that, you know, they're being disrespectful or, you know, whatever, like there's always an underlying situation going on with them. For example, yeah. when I was a teenager, when I was a young teenager, I, w I was coming off as being aggressive and being angry, but you don't know what's the underlying, I got needs that aren't being met. So I'm yelling and screaming because I want somebody to meet these needs, you yes. know? And so that's the that's approach that I use even in the classroom. If I got a child that's acting out and, and behaving in any kind of way, I always get down on their level and just ask them, what do you need? What's mm -hmm. going on? You know, because once you find that out, then you can address it, you know? And I think that as parents, it's really important. That's something that I've always strived to do with my son is to just understand him, hear him out you know, be observant, see, you know, what's going on with him, you know, so. No, that, that, that makes sense, like, finding out, because if their basic needs, like, if they're hungry, they're tired, um, you, just the, the, the core, if that's not happening, forget it, you, you, you've lost them, you know what I mean? I think as educators, as teachers, um, you have the part to, to change someone's destiny in a positive way, I look back at high school because of the the things that I, I was going through on the back end. Like people, I, I was living, you know that term, fake it till you make it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I threw myself into all positive things because I didn't want to be involved in negative things um, because I seen people who struggle with um, alcoholism, addiction, incarcerated and whatnot. And so I was like, oh no, I'm not going to go that way. Mm -hmm. uh, but what what ended up happening was a lot of my teachers till this day, they don't know that they became like a parent to me, mm -hmm. a role model to me, and they saved me. And what, what it was, was they were consistently there. You know, when I go to school, they're there. Mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're reliable. And when they were uh, kind. Yeah. And they were, they believed in you, even when you didn't believe in yourself. Like, that's powerful you know and so sometimes they, like you said a kid can walk in and, and be upset it has nothing to do with the teacher right. it has nothing to do with the classroom it right. could be something going on at home but instead of you feeling attacked by the child like come to their level to understand what do you need what's going on right. and then when you can make them feel loved and and they feel cared for then all the guards come down right. and then you, you help them in the healing from, from all of that pain that unfortunately for a lot of teenagers and a lot of kids, they're put in very unsafe, very painful situations in life. And they're not taught how to cope. They're not taught how to get help. And even in situations where they, they're gonna actually get removed, you know, because it's so severe, the, 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 the family life and, and it's okay. Um, to get help, but they're not taught that. So some people get out and, or some people they're in it the whole time they're in high, up until high school. Like what you shared with me is like, you know, when you're exposed to seeing a certain lifestyle that brings about so much pain and anger, when you get, become an adult, self-love and self-care goes out the door because you weren't taught, right? You weren't taught at, that. <laughs> at all, not one bit. You know, if you, I mean, it's just basic. If you don't have people that's loving you and caring for you, 
in a certain way, then how are you going to learn to love and care for yourself? <laughs> so it has to be demonstrated. Right, like learning that. So do you think, um, do you feel that when like the person, like the, the parents, for example, or like whoever's the caretaker, if they don't show nurturing love towards the child, Mm -hmm. that when the child gets older they can almost feel unworthy un like not valuable not yeah. lovable and so they think it's them when it has nothing to do with them but because they felt so rejected absolutely absolutely that was my experience um I can remember so I used to um like I said I'm a writer so I've always written I think since like elementary school but I will always have diaries that I would write in and I can remember this diary entry that I wrote specifically about my mother and um it stated like I feel like I literally said these words I feel like she hates me and I hate her and um that's what I felt at that time and I think that that's 100% what I meant as well but looking back I can see how that perception was had because like I just said, most of our interactions was negative because of my behavior that was being displayed at school or in the community. Um, and then also the fact that she was dealing with her own stuff. I can look back now and see that my mother, she probably, can you imagine the guilt and the shame and the hurt that she probably felt as a mother that she could no longer, you know, yeah. yeah, that she could no longer function for herself as well as her daughter. And then I ended up having a younger sister as well. So for her two children, you know, and it's like, but I didn't have that understanding. You don't get that understanding awareness till you, you know, you grow older. But looking back, I can see that how what she was battling could have reflected that to me and I could have perceived that which I know wasn't the case which I know was not the case you know right. um and and even now like our relationship has definitely you know transformed totally um though it is I'll be honest it is still you know still working right. progress because yeah. she's still battling um depression and anxiety so there's still a level of um coping you know that, that we're both still um dealing with as far as it, but yeah, absolutely. So me, what me feeling like my mom hates me and then me feeling like my dad don't love me because if he did, he would be here um, or he would at least check in with me or something. I felt so unloved. I felt so unworthy. I just felt like just completely worthless. I really did. And which then resulted in me treating myself that way and allowing other people to treat me like worthless right you know? so absolutely I think that um you know you like I said you have to have that demonstration of love you got to have that demonstration of compassion and then I'll go even further and say that you know you also got to have that that um display of mercy because the more that you begin to learn how to be compassionate for yourself and to have mercy for yourself, then you can extend that to others. So for example, as a parent, like I said, there was a lot of things that I was certainly shameful of, felt guilty, all those kind of things. But once I moved from shame and guilt and hurt and anger and all that to receiving mercy and saying, you know what, Ikea, you are not the only person who's made this mistake. You're not the only person who's gone through this. You're not the only parent who fought this way. You're not the only parent who's done this. And I begin to see and realize like everybody has some flaws to some extent. Everybody makes mistakes. Yeah. So I begin to, you know, grant myself mercy and to the fact that I'm not holding myself accountable and not holding myself, not accountable, but not holding myself captive to the mistakes that I did 10, 15 however long ago, years ago, it's not fair to do that because yeah. all humans make mistakes. See, the um, difference is, Ikea is some people admit and others don't. But the people who are willing to come forward and admit, they, they, they receive mercy and freedom. Yeah, well, like I said, it has to start with self. 
because of course if you're a person who can't extend yourself mercy and compassion you're not gonna be able to extend that to other people you're right. not great. if you don't know your truth and admit your truth you're not gonna accept others truth <laughs> You know, and I'll even share, you know, one thing that has been one of the greatest lessons also um, of my life is that forgiveness, not only for self, but for others, because, you know, I did walk around with a certain level of resentment towards both of my parents, because I'm like, I felt like y'all both left me just out here. Like I was just out here, you know, but like I said, as I began to have a better understanding of my mother and what she was dealing with, then I could have compassion on her and say, you know what? She was doing the best that she could as a mother at that time, given what she was fighting up against. Right. You know? And so then I was able to, you know, have a better understanding and extend compassion towards her and mercy and no longer even hold her to, well, you wasn't doing this. And I probably wouldn't have gotten into all this stuff if I had parents who was there. And the same thing as far as my father. Like I said earlier, I'm like, well, if my dad was there to protect me, I would have never been experiencing the abuse and different kind of stuff that I did you know right. I had to also again extend compassion and forgiveness for him because I later actually found out that my father also grew up fatherless so mm -hmm. he ultimately didn't have nobody to show him how to be a father and I guess he was doing what he thought was best maybe he thought it was better for him to to stay away because he thought that maybe he couldn't handle the task or whatever you know what I mean so regardless I had to like I said, I first had to forgive myself and to have mercy on myself for my mistakes. And then I had to also extend that to the people that I love, you know, because like I said, we all have error as humans. Yes. We all do, you know. So oh, yes, we do. We got to be real about parent, it. It's humbling. Yeah, you got to be real about it and accept it. And I'll tell you, one of the things that really led me to begin to be more compassionate and merciful and gracious is when I used to see my son um, holding things against me and I would just be almost like begging and pleading for his mercy. Wow. And, for his grace. Yeah. and I believe that God really like allowed him to be that mirror for me to look and be like, if you want your son to be compassionate towards you for the things that you put him through, because there's things you've done and you've exposed him to, you know what I mean? If you want him to learn to forgive you and to be compassionate towards you, then you got to do that to other people as well. Wow, so that's very heavy. Very like humble. you said, they they know. They do. They may they, not tell them, but they know. They are so intuitive. They are more aware than we realize as parents. That's why I said that even if you're this perfect, you're presenting this perfection in front of them, but behind closed doors, something else, they'll pick up on that stuff. They really do. Really you know, um, something I learned that was um, humbling for me is, so I got separated and divorced when my son was two. And I was living in Japan and we moved back to Hawaii. I, I always wanted to be this positive, peppy person, cheerleader mom. But then I had to um, be like uh, authoritative with him because the dad was living overseas for five years. And so he would only see his dad once a year because of the, 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 his job and whatnot. And so I remember like disciplining him, having talks and, you know, I had to uh, correct him and then just seeing him like cry, you know, cause he, he doesn't like that side of me when I'm upset and I'm correcting him. And I remember he was, I think he was like three or four and I was on my knees and he's crying and I looked at him and I said no matter how mad I get at you I'll always love you do you know that and he was like you know and he nods he's like I'll always love you and then I was like then I started crying because it's like you know you don't want to raise your kid to to be a brat to be spoiled you want them to have a good heart to know that God loves them and to allow them to contribute. But I know how like you and I felt like, not feeling love, not feeling re cared for at times. And I, I, when you look at them and you see fear in their eyes, especially if you're a single parent, you're like, dang, like I don't want them to ever feel like 
if they make a mistake that the love that I have is cut off. Right. You know, but even now I tell him, you know, I love you, right? I can always love you. I don't care if you're put in a bad situation, you call me, you know, don't ever fear calling me, you know, but I feel like I have to tell him that because if not, then what if he does get put in a really crazy situation? I want him to know I'm, I'm going to show up. Right. You know what I mean? And so that that's kind of like what I've learned. And he showed me more grace than I show myself. And so I had to learn to be more gracious. But then I learned that from God, like the love that God has for us. I can't even wrap my mind around it. Right. But that's the only thing that gives me hope is God's love. And I can see it through my son like I'm so imperfect as a parent but to see his love for me it's like wow like I'm imperfect you know absolutely yes <laughs> but that's good like that you're you've learned to let go and to to forgive not so much for that person but for yourself absolutely because not being held hostage by that anger already that's what I'm saying. You ultimately are the one who suffers. And I had to live through that, you know, walking around with that just, like I say, I can only describe it as a heaviness. It is always right here. You almost can feel the heaviness on your shoulders and your chest when you're walking around with that stuff, whether it's that guilt, that shame, that unforgiveness, whatever. Um, and like you said as well, it really took God and himself to really showed me like if I love you this much why aren't you loving yourself this much wow. and if I love you this much I expect you to reflect that love to others like who how dare you not how dare you withhold the love that I'm giving you wow okay. yeah that's why he says this little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine but in order for it to shine you you, you have to let go of yeah you that. gotta open up you gotta be open <laughs> you gotta be open or it can't you know <laughs> it can't shine through <laughs> right so it's cool because like i can see um like as you shared like you have to go through your own healing journey mm -hmm. from it all like yeah you're gonna have kickbacks and triggers from mm -hmm. things that you've gone through but then you, you you've learned coping skills and and that's that's what you want people to realize that we all have a history however if we learn how to cope mm -hmm. with it we'll, we'll, we'll go through it because it comes like waves the emotions and the feelings yeah. it comes in waves and yeah. i was telling someone i was like yeah like a tsunami <laughs> it, like i'm just gonna lay here because that was really bad <laughs> yeah <laughs> And so, I mean, going through dark times is, is no joke, but it's real. However, we, we have to get tools. And mm -hmm. so I'm glad that you're doing um, parent, um, parenting with power um, to, to help people to be vulnerable and to allow other people in your life. So together we can help each other to move forward. Yeah. Cause we weren't all taught a lot. Our parents weren't taught. Our parents' parents weren't taught how to cope. Exactly, you know how to express yourself. Like you are seen, not heard. You know, like right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I think we come from that era of like you do as I say, and you know, not as I do. <laughs> on in this house, stays in this house. <laughs> you know, and like I said, like everybody can maybe your grandparents and parents could live under those rules or those but not everybody can handle mentally psychologically physically live that way like you said you, you just feel heavy mm -hmm. and then it starts breaking you down and so if that doesn't work for you then change it right maybe as kids we couldn't but we're adults now so now we break the cycle that yeah. vicious cycle of shame, of guilt, of fear, of rejection. Absolutely. So that we can make our kids raised to to feel loved and to to be able to voice their concerns and and express to us like, no, that's not what I mean, mom. Right. This is what I I want. This is what I really, really mean. You know? And just be patient with them learning how to express to us. Yeah, exactly. Because I say my son 
has grown up totally different. You know, I feel like he he gets more opportunities to be heard than I did growing up. Because like I said, it was that whole thing of like, you don't talk back to adults. And not so much even talk back, but sometimes that could be misunderstood of when a kid is sharing what's on their mind and their heart, then right. it could be interpreted wrong. But um, I have been just intentional about allowing my son to tell me exactly how he feels because I know what it feels like to be unheard and to feel like you can't say what's really on your mind or your heart. Um, so like you said, just changing those things that if that didn't work for me, <laughs> you know, then I'm not for them <laughs> because that is the way that I was brought up. You know, and that, like I said, that's another thing that I really touch on as far as teaching parents different ways. Now, I'm not saying that there's a right way and a wrong way, but I offer a lot of just resources on different types of parenting so that we have something to work with so that, you know, maybe this method isn't working for us. Let me try something different. And if that doesn't work, then I got something else so that we just have those tools in our toolbox so that we can, you know, go and change as we go. Adjust. Yeah, it's like being a mechanic, not, you don't use the same tool to, to do right. different projects. And so that's basically what you're providing is tools. You, it's your decision because you know what your project is, you know right. what situation you're walking into. And it may have worked with the last situation, but it doesn't. I've learned with my son, he's 13, 13 and a half. I've learned when I talk to him to use less words. And because and I'm a passionate person uh, to pray, journal, whatever, like get the emotion out, the, the drama. I can be a little dramatic. <laughs> like, what? what? <laughs> like, I can't believe, you know what I mean? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> like, my initial response, like, say if I'm upset or angry because you know better like you know right. you already had this talk and you still lie you know whatever the the yeah. issue is right yeah uh, to to still address it however without all of that yeah and, theatrics. <laughs> yeah the, the theatrics yeah so i've learned to cut back my because the dad is like okay so when the dad talks to him it's like he looks at him Kainua or daniel you know better right yes don't do it again that's it i'm like Really, guy? Really? <laughs> He's a good dad, but that's really good. Um, so, but I'm more thorough. You know, I like to go deeper. Like, what right. okay, were you thinking? Mm -hmm. Do you remember we stuff like that? So, but I'm learning to like to pull back a little bit on the emotions. He's a boy, and his style. You know, like everybody's different and mm -hmm. stuff like that. But he just—he's very simple. He 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 gets it right off the bat. And so the dad, like we just had a recent incident that dad explained to me that you do need to tell him that you were disappointed because he respects you. And so I did. And then the dad talked to him and then like it triggered it and he was like emotional about it. Uh, but it was cool. Like I had to talk, I, I co-parent with the dad. So I'm fortunate that we, we were cordial. Uh, we're not like best friends, but we're cordial and, uh, and that we're able to um, support one another in, in raising him, even though most of the time he's with me. Um, and then during like the breaks, he has like long, like weeks or like maybe a month with the dad and stuff like that. So, but that's, yeah, I'm excited for you though. You're going to publish a book this year and I'm going to connect you with my girlfriend that wrote her book. Mama's got, in fact, she's on her second book this year. Okay. Yeah, and so uh, she 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 has an online book, uh, Kindle, and then you, through Amazon, you can buy it through Amazon. But I'm gonna connect you with her because I think you guys can. It is cool. Like, what, what, she's an educator, like I said, for 20 years, okay. and um, she she has two. In fact, her 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 youngest one just graduated high school, so she has one in college and one entering. And so, and she has she's like you. She loves education. She has a passion. <laughs> I just love teaching people because like I said, I just believe that the more information you have, the better that you can go through life, you know? Yeah. I mean, you didn't know before. Okay, cool. Well, now you know. <laughs> I mean, for 
really. I, I mean, it's just so empowering when you have knowledge about things. I mean, it's totally transformed my, my life. Like I said, the more education I've had on mental illness and things, the better I was able to cope, better I was able to understand what it's like, you know, and seeing that, you know, the more that I've learned about it, it's like it becomes nor it normalizes mental illness. You know, the more you know about it, then it becomes like, oh, it's not this weird thing. Scary, yeah. You know, a lot of things that happen when someone's experiencing mental illness, they're almost predictable signs and predictable, you know, behaviors or whatever. So the more that you have that information, then you can be able to say, okay, okay. Like now you can expect or not expect certain things because you have that information about, okay, what this looks like. So. But yeah, that's pretty powerful because I think you're going to be able to help parents to know their breaking points. Like, okay, mom, dad, when you can tell, these are signs, you know, when you're, you're, you have to step back and take care of your mental health. Absolutely. And then if you can just educate them on certain things, they're like, oh, that's what it is. Yeah. You know, because then it prevents the parents from having breakdowns, you know, emotional breakdowns and feeling like a failure. It, it's, they're not feeling it's just the kid is going through a phase in their life and it, 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 it's just their phase and the parents feeling like they're not doing enough or they're, they're, you know, they're feeling when it's just the kid is like becoming self-aware of certain things and they're not handling their awareness of themselves. And so just like teaching them how to back off and get involved and let other people involved to help them navigate certain exactly. phases in the kids' lives. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm excited. Well, um, thank you so much for your time. I could go on and on with you, but I look forward to helping you um, with um, your new venture. Um, for, guys, she, she's basically taken a blog and she converted it over and you're about to um, make it into a non-profit. Non yeah. Mm -hmm. And you're a mom and you are a team mom. And look, she you're using your life experiences as a stepping stone to help other parents and teenagers. Absolutely. It is no longer crushing me. I'm crushing it. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Ikea, can you please share um, what is the best way for people to find you on social media? Yes. So, um, Parenting with Power is on Facebook. Um, my personal social media is, um, Ikea, I-K-E-Y-A, Days, D-A-Y-S, um, on Instagram, which I'm not as active. I'm more active on Facebook, so you can find me on Facebook at Ikea, okay. um, I-K-E-Y-A, N-O-R-R-I-S. Um, also, I have a, a website for Parenting with Power, but pretty okay. much everything that I share on the website is on the Facebook, and I okay. am most engaged on Facebook. So okay. No, everybody has a platform that they're they're more comfortable with. I I personally I'm more on Instagram just because um, of my grieving um, and mental health. I find that I found a very loving, supportive group on Instagram. Okay. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll connect you with some people. You you'll be inspired. Be like, oh, okay, they're there. And then another thing too is you might want to consider when you start moving into your, um, your nonprofit is, uh, for awareness is TikTok. Oh gosh. So I tried, <laughs> I tried. No, to get people who just do it. Like they, <laughs> they do inspiration. You don't need to do that. See, everybody just assumes that TikTok is all dance. <laughs> and you know no, what? you don't have to be. <laughs> That's all I assumed that it was. And I tried okay. to, I created the account. Um, I tried to record once and then I just kind of didn't like how the recording turned out and I just kind of gave up on it. So. No, I, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do another meeting and I'll, I'll show you. People need to realize it's just, a it's another platform to get your message out. Okay. I follow people who, when they speak, they, they just do, um, words. Okay. Point one, point two, point three for education. Okay. Good. Yeah. So how do you overcome? And then they do one, two, three, and then it pops up the words. 
Yeah. Mm. You you have to definitely. Yeah, I, no, I'll show you. You're gonna be blown away. You'd be like, oh, it's it's really good for people like you, educators, because if you love kids and parents and they're all there, it's a it's a great community. But it's converting over for awareness okay. and educating. You know, people are sharing deep stuff about abuse. Um, they're they're sharing stuff that people are like, wait, this is supposed to be a happy place, you know. But then it's like, well, sorry, you know eventually it's going to have to change over. And so you have people who are dancing and singing mm -hmm. and then you have people who are doing healing stuff, art and meditation is cool. And then you have nonprofits on there providing services and letting people know if you need us, we're here for you. Okay. Well, yeah. I'll have to have a session with you. To oh yeah. We're, we're going to go there. Cause I, I always get that feedback. We're like, oh, I don't dance. I'm like, no, no, it's not about dancing, guys. We can make it into something special. I do dance. I think as well. I guess those are like two fun facts about me as well. But I do I my own choreography. I can't. I've seen their dancing, and uh, I'd rather do my own choreography because I, girl, I grew up in the '80s and '90s, so I'm like, mm -mm. there. Some of their dance moves, I'm like. We may as well go back to what we, you know what I mean? They yeah. did that. We used to do, um, uh, yeah, CNC Factory, Janet Jackson guys. I'm like, no, let's do those guys' choreography. <laughs> MC Hammer. <laughs> oh, you're taking it all the way back. Right. Okay, for for some people, what is the website? Again, what is the um, the the name for the website? So you can go to www.parentingwithpower.org. Okay. Um, but like I said, I'm most active and engaged on the Facebook page, Parenting with Power. Parenting with Power, okay. And then I guess my email, um, if someone wanted to contact me directly, is info at parenting with power at gmail. Or info parenting with power at gmail, I'm sorry. Okay. Info oh. parenting with power at gmail.com. Okay. Well, Stay on the line. Um, I'm just going to end this meeting right here. But thank you so much for joining us. I and I, I'm excited to what we're going to be accomplishing for the rest of 2020. <laughs> okay, hold on. Wait. I wanted to. Oh, okay, there. <laughs>